For millennia, people from different countries, cultures, and backgrounds have found direction and encouragement in the inspired pages of the Bible. In his day, Jesus directed listeners to search the prophecies of Scripture to find Him the only way of salvation. 2,000 years later, as we stand on the break of eternity, we no less need the purpose and hope God's Word provides. Sacramento Central Church brings you Receiving the Word, timely Bible messages presented by pastors Chris Buttery and Mike Thompson. Amazing revelations await you in God's Holy Word, the Bible. Following God is a process. And we're told that sanctification is the work of how long? A lifetime. Now, I believe that this process can be viewed in four distinct stages. And I call them... Now, you may have a a different way of expressing this, but I think ultimately, irrespective of how you express it, you get to the same conclusion. That is, there is four distinct, or you may have steps in between, but four distinct stages or steps in the process of being conformed and changed and to come to ultimately where God wants us to be. The first one I call salvation. The second, transformation. The third, obedience. And the fourth, possession. You can think of it as stop, S-T-O-P. Salvation, transformation, obedience, and possession. Until you have received salvation, you cannot be transformed. And until you are transformed, you will not be obedient. And until you become obedient, you will not possess the promises of God. Now, I want to look at each one of these steps briefly, but distinctly. The first one is, what did I say it was? Salvation. Ephesians chapter 2 and verse 8. Ephesians chapter 2 and verse 8 says, For by grace are ye saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is the gift, of God. So we're saved by grace through faith and it's not something that we merit or work up. It's not of ourselves, the Bible says. It is a gift of God. Now Romans 10, Romans 10, 9 and 10, this is one of our favorite texts when I was an evangelical. That if you will confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus Christ, and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you shall be saved. For with the heart man believes unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. Now, why is it that so many who claim to be saved and claim to be children of God, I mean all Christians from all denominational orientations will claim Christ as their Savior. Well, why is it, my question again, all of the Christians who claim to be saved, claim to be children of God, why do they not obey God? You see, you can see them everywhere. And they seem to be good people. Again, they claim to love God, but they make their own choices and their own rules about their personal behaviors and their life's direction. You see, we will never be obedient to God until we have been transformed. Obedience is not, by the way, 
a natural inclination. Selfishness and disobedience are our natural inclinations. Disobedience, by the way, is what got the human race into the mess that it's in in the first place. And because of sin, you and I were hardwired out of the womb to be disobedient and rebellious to God. So by necessity, we have to be transformed in order to have any kind of personal relationship with God at all. Well, let's look at transformation. Romans chapter 12 and verse 1. Romans chapter 12 and verse 1 says, I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. Verse 2, and be not conformed to this world, but be what? Transformed by the renewing of your mind. Okay, now it's, it's telling us right here what transformed really is. It says, by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. So clearly... We will be either transformed by the renewing of our minds or we will be conformed to the world. I think I'd rather have my mind renewed. How about you? So how can we be transformed after we have received salvation? How does that work and how can we go about making it a reality for us? Well, I believe there's a simple answer to that question. And that is, this is how we're transformed. By prayer and the word. Prayerfulness, when combined with ingesting, that is reading, studying, meditating on the word of God, leads to the revealed will and direction of God in your life. Are we encouraged to pray? Here's what the Bible says in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 17. Again, you all can quote this scripture by heart. Pray without ceasing. I never stop praying. But every time you see me, I'm not on my knees. But I do have a connection with God going all the time. And I can pick up that phone anytime I need it. Romans 12, 12 says, Rejoicing in hope, patient in tribulation, continuing instant in prayer. Now, if you will just look up in, 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 in your Strong's Concordance and See what that word instant means. The Greek, in the Greek, it means not what we think of like microwave. <laughs> Here's what instant means. It means to be earnest toward, to persevere, and be constantly diligent. So... If I put all of that in my verse, this is what it would say to me. Rejoicing in hope, patient in tribulation, continuing earnestly in prayer, persevering in prayer, and being constantly diligent in prayer. I think God wants us to pray. Colossians 4.2. It says... Continue in prayer and watch in the same with thanksgiving. Never stop praying. Continue in prayer 
and watch in the same with thanksgiving. And Jesus said, in Luke 18 and verse 1, he said, Men ought always to pray and not faint. Don't give up. Instead of giving up, pray. Jesus said so. So we have this part of our equation, prayer, clearly from the Scripture. God wants us to pray. And then we combine prayer with the Word of God. Oh, you go to Psalms 119, and it is so replete with wonderful texts about the Word. Psalm 119, verse 11, says, Thy word have I hid in my heart, that I might not sin against thee. Where does God want it? He wants it inside of us. Psalm 119, verse 16, it says, I will delight myself in thy statutes. I will not forget thy word. Same Psalm 119, verse 101 says, I have refrained my feet from every evil way that I might keep thy word. Verse 105, thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. Verse 133, order my steps in thy word and let not iniquity have dominion over me. And Jesus said in his wonderful prayer, John 17, 17, he says, sanctify them through thy truth. Then he tells us what truth is. What is it? Thy word is truth. So we come to God in faith and we receive grace for salvation. And through the surrender of our lives to him, we grow in grace and we're transformed through prayer and the word of God. And then when we are transformed, and only then, friends, when we're transformed, will we be consistently obedient to God. Do you think God wants us to be obedient to him? Of course he does. Why? Why does God want us to obey him? You see, he knows that he knows better than we do what is best for us. And the only way we can follow what is best for us is if we obey him. Well, let's look at obedience, which is the next point here. Deuteronomy chapter 30, verse 14. But the word is very nigh unto thee in thy mouth and in thy heart, and then it tells us what it's there for, that thou may obey it or do it. It says the word is near, it's in your mouth, it's in your heart, and it's there so that you can do it. Exodus chapter 19 and verse 5. He says, now therefore, <clears throat> if ye will obey my voice, Indeed, and keep my covenant, then you shall be a peculiar treasure unto me above all the people, for all the earth is mine. Same book, Exodus chapter 23, verse 22 says, But if thou shalt indeed obey his voice and do all that I speak, then I will be an enemy unto thine enemies and an adversary unto thine adversaries. It's all linked to obedience. Jeremiah chapter 7, verse 23, it says, But this thing commanded I them, saying, Obey my voice, and I will be your God. And ye shall be my people, and walk ye in all the ways that I have commanded you, that it may be well unto you. It is all connected to obedience. Do you all see that? And then in the book of Acts, 
chapter 5, verse 29. Peter speaking, says, Peter and the other apostles answered and said to them, we ought to obey who? God rather than men. And that's always the option that we have before us, isn't it? Obey God or obey something or someone else. And then Philippians 2.13 gives us a wonderful, wonderful insight. It says, For it is God which works in you both to will and to do of his good pleasure. You see, if we have been transformed by Christ in order to be disobedient to God working in us, we actually have to resist his spirit which is at work in us to will and to do of his good pleasure. You see, the sinner, that is the person who is, has not surrendered their life to Christ, to that person, disobedience is normal and it's natural. To the child of God, disobedience requires act resistance to the Holy Spirit which is at work in us to will and to do of God's good pleasure you've got to on purpose resist the Spirit of God in order to disobey God if you have a surrendered heart so disobedience is simply the rejection of the work of the Holy Spirit in our lives. Disobedience is always a choice. I remember the, the old comedian Flip Wilson, he would always, his line was, the devil made me do it. The devil make, doesn't make you do anything. You choose to do it. If we would simply yield our will to God's will, according to the Bible, he will do the work. So obedience is simply yielding to the spirit and the word of God. And when we do that, he does the rest. Isn't that good news? Well, let's move on to the last one, which is possession. Isaiah chapter 1, verse 19 says, if you are willing, I should give you a second to get there. Some of you are already there. Fast Bible fingers. If you are willing, I'm reading Isaiah 1, 19. If you are willing and obedient. Notice these conditions that God always gives us here. If you are willing and obedient, you shall eat the good of the land. In 1 John chapter 3, verse 21, Beloved, if our heart condemn us not, uh, condemn us not then we have confidence toward God. And whatsoever we ask, we receive of him. Why? Because we, what? Keep his commandments and do what? Do those things that are pleasing in his sight. Whatever we ask, he says, we receive of him because we keep his commandments, we are obedient, and we please him in the things that we do. 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 21. Therefore, let no man glory in men. How many of you believe the Bible today? Well, let's read the next sentence. He says, for all things are yours. He says, don't glory in men because all things belong to you. But he says, whether Paul or Apollos or Cephas, now we don't have those brethren with us anymore, but we have a lot of others. You can put your name in there. 
whatever the names you want to put in there. He says, whether Paul, Apollos, or Cephas, or the world, or life, or death, or things present, or things to come, I don't think he's leaving anything out. He says, all are yours, and you are Christ, and Christ is God's. Amen. I just want to jump up and down right now. Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. So we, through obedience, possess all things, but we don't claim ownership to any of it. We claim ownership to nothing, but all things belong to us. You know why? Because we know who the true owner is. He makes us stewards of whatever, but he's the true owner. You see, with respect to earthly possessions, we don't possess or shouldn't possess anything that we're not willing to give away if God says to give it away. If I'm not willing to part with a thing, I don't care what it is, if I am not willing to part with a thing, that thing has too much control over me. And I have chosen to not be controlled by anything but God. He tells us in 1 John chapter 2, verse 15, Love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. For if any man loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. <clears throat> so everything that's in the world, we don't love it. We may use it, it may serve a purpose, but our love is to God. One of the problems in Christianity today, and I was very, very much in the Word of Faith movement as a Pentecostal, and one of the problems is that people are taught that they can go straight from salvation, praying the sinner's prayer, to claiming the promises. Their lives are a mess. They live in disobedience to God's Word. Yet their confessions are usually about believing God for this or that thing. And they wonder why it doesn't work for them. They don't give either of their resources or their time to reach the loss. They don't witness. And in some cases, you're glad they don't. <laughs> they don't study their Bibles regularly. And they don't pray consistently. Wouldn't it be wonderful if we could, all of us, if we could dedicate one hour of our day in prayer and the Word? Just one hour. That's not even a tithe of our time. I always suggest to people, start with what you're able to do and then progressively do more. And God will help you in your desire to grow in him. And what you'll soon discover is that one hour is not nearly enough. We just have to have our priorities in order, and God will help us with the rest. Now remember, if there's no transformation, there is no obedience. And if there is no obedience, there is no possession of the promises of God. And with no possession of God's promises, we live a different Defeated life, defeated life and present to the world an anemic witness. Always struggling with one thing or another. Angry. Worried. Fearful. Selfish. And unforgiving. And God doesn't want his children to live like that. As children of God, it's our business to walk in God's love. As children of God, it's our business to study and to pray consistently. It's our business 
as God's children to reject the world and everything that it stands for. It's our business to keep his commandments and live an obedient life. It's our business to have his victory. And as we take our stand in Christ, he sanctifies us and we become a royal priesthood. You see, becoming a priest unto the Lord requires the willingness to lay aside everything that most people hold dear and become totally consecrated unto the Lord. It requires laying aside all other alliances in order to uphold love and commitment to God. It demands an experience with God that takes us from salvation to possession. Being a priest was not and is not a glamorous business. But it's a labor of love because it brings joy to our hearts to please the Father. You see, the Old Testament priests, they labored all day offering sacrifices, offerings for the sins of the people. Jesus, our high priest, he offered himself for our deliverance. He was stripped naked. He was battered, bloody, exposed completely. That sacrifice began with him, and it ended with him. No glamour, no fanfare, just a sacrificial and priestly ministry to take away the sin of the world. He offered his life the supreme sacrifice that made it possible for us to be saved, for us to be transformed, for us to be obedient, and for us to possess our possessions. Who is on the Lord's side? Are we willing to identify with the Christ of Calvary, with the Church of the New Testament, and with the forefathers of our faith who went before us and followed them, who century after century were willing at the, at the cost of peril, persecution, torture, and death to stand on the word of God and to possess eternal possessions. Who is on the Lord's side? Are you willing to take your stand today? Will you step out from the ordinary and become a priest unto him? We're so glad you decided to tune in to today's Receiving the Word program. If you have a special prayer request, we would be happy to pray about it for you. To discover more about the Bible through our free online Bible studies or to listen to more life-changing Bible messages, go to saccentral.org and click on the Media Resources tab. If you've been blessed or encouraged by our ministry and God impresses you to support us, then visit our website or write to us at 6045 Camellia Avenue, Sacramento, California, 95819. Always gladly receive God's Word.